Hello, and thank you for um, coming tonight to our webinar, our last in the series. This is number seven on the Alaska State Wildlife Refuges and Place-Based Learning within those special places. And I'm really excited to introduce Joe Meehan tonight, the manager for the, this refuge system, and to talk to you a little bit about the, um, the program itself and all of its ins and outs. And um, with that, I'll go ahead and just turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. I appreciate being invited to come do this. I always like talking about the refuges. Um, as we go through the program, feel free to uh, interrupt and call out uh, with any questions. It'd be easier, to, I think, to address them as we're going through them and as, you, uh, as they occur to you. So I'm with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game in our wildlife division, and I manage a statewide program of refuges, sanctuaries, and critical habitat areas. And what I want to do with this program is just talk about refuges, uh, what they are, their history, their creation, um, get you a little bit familiar with the refuge program, uh, what the refuges are, what's in them, kind of the variety of refuges that we have in Alaska, and how we and you are refuge managers for these places. And we'll talk a bit more about that in just a minute. And then some of our management challenges that we have in managing refuges. But before we do that, I know a lot of people are uh, confused by the different agencies and land designations for um, wildlife refuges, parks, there's national forests, uh, of course a lot of wildlife biologists, park rangers, forest rangers, there's state areas and national areas, and a lot of people don't really realize the difference between all of those. And primarily what we're going to be dealing with today are the state of Alaska, uh, wildlife Refuge Program, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that means, but in a nutshell, refuges, whether they're state or federally owned uh, and managed, uh, are primarily protect areas for wildlife habitat, and it doesn't mean that the animals are necessarily protected, because the vast majority of our refuges do allow hunting and fishing in them, but it's really all about the habitat. We're protecting the habitat, which is going to promote healthy populations of fish and wildlife. Now, refuges differ a little bit in parks in that while a lot of parks also protect habitats, um, the park's emphasis is generally uh, are geared towards public recreation, hiking, camping, um, human activities. But obviously we can't do those human activities without the fish and wildlife and the habitat in those parks. But just a little bit of difference. But again, today we're talking about our state of Alaska wildlife refuge program. And first of all, let's take a look at land ownership in Alaska. Um, this map's a little bit uh, busy, but just make note of the areas in blue. That's all the state of Alaska owned lands. And the majority of the rest of the state is federally owned. And those would be the green, browns, and the tan areas. And then some of the green area, I'm sorry, the orange areas are owned by native corporations, which are uh, private lands, and then there's a very small amount of lands in Alaska that are actually owned privately by individuals like you and me. Um, and we'll go to more of that in just a minute. But, um, it, you know, Alaska at statehood in 1959, we were entitled to select lands from the federal government to put into state ownership and to be used for state purposes. And still today about... Uh, two-thirds of Alaska is still owned by the federal government. The state of Alaska owns about a quarter, but all told, about 90% of Alaska is still owned by public entities. Now, when I say public entities, that's you and me. It's all of us. Uh, the federal areas are owned by every citizen in the United States, and of course, our state of Alaska areas are owned by every citizen in Alaska. But at statehood, the state was allowed to start selecting lands and it was capped at 104 million acres, which again, if, if we selected all 104 million acres of land, it would be about 25% of the state. And so after statehood, the state of Alaska started selecting various lands, and a lot of those obviously were done for development, infrastructure, and other purposes, but the state uh, also started selecting lands for wildlife purposes. And a lot of these wildlife areas were kind of what I call the cream of the crop areas. This particular site is now the McNeil River State Game Sanctuary. It's the world's large, largest congregation of brown bears. 
We've seen up to 80 brown bears congregated uh, in this stretch of river in this bottom photograph. And there was areas like that the state of Alaska was primarily interested in obtaining and managing for the people of Alaska and our visitors. The very first area that the state of Alaska selected for conservation purposes is the Walrus Islands in Bristol Bay. And at the time, it was the last remaining terrestrial-based haul-out for Pacific walruses in Alaska. And uh, previous to that, a walrus uh, had been hunted in previous decades, and uh, uh, their numbers did, did decline some. But more importantly, they were uh, commercially harvested and, and disturbed a lot of their other haul-outs, so they abandoned a lot of those haul-outs. But Round Island in the Walrus Island Sanctuary uh, was one of the last remaining haul-outs. And so the state of Alaska wanted to obtain that haul-out to protect it. And that was in 1960, so just a year after statehood is when the state of Alaska selected those lands and protected them. Another example of protected lands that the state of Alaska obtained was Potter Marsh, which is part of the Anchorage Coastal Wildlife Refuge. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about this refuge and its popularity in a few minutes. Uh, one thing I just do want to point out uh, of a recent observation at Potter Marsh, Marsh, which is popular for wildlife viewing and photography, is the sighting of an Asian duck, the falcated duck, um, which looks like maybe a cross between a widgeon and a green-winged teal, uh, but it has never been sighted before on mainland Alaska. There were some sightings in the western Aleutian Islands, but not on mainland Alaska. So this has been a very popular visitor to Potter Marsh here just south of Anchorage. And in fact, we posted it on Facebook, and it's been the most popular posting that the Department of Fish and Game has ever put out on Facebook. We had about a quarter million uh, views so far of that particular Facebook site. But again, Potter Marsh is really popular for school groups, um, people watching and photographing wildlife, um, and just getting out into some natural wildlife habitat just outside of Anchorage. Uh, many of our uh, state wildlife areas were uh, mirrored after the creation of federal refuges, which um, originally were geared towards um, protecting habitats for waterfowl. And waterfowl hunters are often credited with being the original conservationists and trying to set up a series of protected habitat areas that they call refuges across the lower 48. And after Alaska became a state, that effort um, took off up here in Alaska, and a lot of our refuge areas were created by local residents who were interested in making sure the habitat was uh, protected in perpetuity in those areas. Um, and today we have 32 different state wildlife refuges, sanctuaries, or critical habitat areas. I collectively refer to them as refuges or refuge areas. Um, but they include uh, marine seabird areas, uh, interior boreal forests, coastal wetlands, and a whole variety of habitats located throughout Alaska. There's, as I mentioned, 32 of these areas. A majority of them are centered around um, the Matsu Valley, uh, Anchorage, Cook Inlet. And many of these are the estuary areas at the mouths of major river systems. Um, also, there's a big uh, concentration of them out in Bristol Bay along the Alaska Peninsula. And again, those are mostly at the mouths of um, the river systems. And a lot of wetlands and a lot of waterfowl and shorebird habitat in those areas. But it also protects uh, any other wildlife species that are in there, at least their habitat. Uh, there are a couple interior up around Fairbanks. There are two refuge areas. And then in southeast, there are four different refuge areas. And how did these areas get established? Well, the Constitution of the state of Alaska gave the state legislature the authority to pull lands out of the general public domain and set them aside for pur special purposes. And those were including um, refuges or sanctuaries. As I mentioned, the Walrus Islands was the first sanctuary created in 1960. Uh, Kachemak Bay was the first state park, again, another special area in 1970. And then we also have state forests, and the first one there was created in 1982. Um, our refuge system, our state of Alaska wildlife refuge system, is, is little known. It's not as popular, say, as the federal refuge system, nor is it as popular or well known as our Alaska state park system. 
but most people don't realize that we have about as many acres protected in our refuges as we do in our state parks. And that's probably due to the fact that, again, state parks, one of the primary emphasis of those areas is for public recreation. So people who recreate a lot, whether it's hiking and mountain biking and other activities like that, are probably more familiar with parks than they are refuges. Um, the statutory purposes of both the, of all three areas, refuges, critical habitat areas, and sanctuaries, it's very similar. Again, it's habitat protection. And it's a slightly difference in the level of habitat protection and where the bar lies in what we allow or don't allow to happen in those areas. Um, but really, again, the bottom line is habitat protection. And our management for these areas starts with the Constitution, which allows the legislature to set these areas aside. And then, of course, the legislature creates the legislation, and they may put some specific language in those laws telling us how we're supposed to manage them or what the area is being managed for. And then based on those laws, we develop regulations. And all those regulations go through a public process. Uh, we do it through either management plans, the Board of Game and the Board of Fish are involved in the development of regulations that affect our refuge areas, and we can adopt, again, through a public process, regulations approved by the Commissioner of the Department of Fish and Game. And all of those regulations are designed to meet our regulatory obligations um, and the statutory obligations. And I'm not going to go into those in detail. Uh, but just to go into some of our major programs that we have on the public use side is we have three sanctuaries at McNeil River, um, the Walrus Islands, which Round Island is a centerpiece, and Stan Price Sanctuary, or also called Pat Creek, down in southeast Alaska. So we have major programs with staff in those three areas in the summertime. We also have uh, major programs at Creamers Field and Fairbanks, Potter Marsh I mentioned here in Anchorage. Our Matsu area refuges, we have several up there. We have um, fairly large visitor programs there. Um, we only really have one traditional campground in any of our refuges, you know, where you can pull in with your RV, and that's in the Little Susitna River Public Use Facility, and that's in the Sioux Flats, or Susitna Flats State Game Refuge. Uh, we have had an involvement at Wolverine Creek, which is in the Redout Bay Critical Habitat Area. It's a bear viewing site in, um, on the west side of Cook Inlet. Uh, we used to have a program for the Kachemak Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve. Uh, that was a fish and game managed program, but that was recently transferred over to the University of Alaska that now oversees that program. Uh, we have staff that do permitting for activities in our refuge areas, and then we have uh, significant activities dealing with fish and wildlife harvest in our refuge areas, or at least in some of them. The sanctuaries are closed to hunting. But most of the other critical habitat areas and refuge areas do allow hunting in those, and um, those regulations are typically dictated by the Board of Game and the Board of Fish. Um, I will digress one moment from our state refuge program, and at statehood, the legislature realized how important protecting habitat was to maintain fish and wildlife in Alaska, maintain healthy populations, maintain our subsistence and recreational activities that are dependent on fish and wildlife, and they acknowledged that the federal refuges that were already in existence in Alaska at the time of statehood were important to the state. So they recognized that, and they actually made those federal refuges also state refuges. But that was very much um, a, uh, a uh, kind of a ceremonial designation because they're federal lands, and the state has no jurisdiction over federal lands. So it was basically just acknowledging what the purposes of those lands are and complementing that. Um, to just emphasize it. Uh, one refuge that's a little bit unique is the Eisenbeck State Game Refuge, and that was one of the refuges at statehood that was also co-designated a state game refuge, but it also added the waters of Eisenbeck Lagoon and the offshore near marine waters outside Eisenbeck Lagoon. So although most of the land areas are, is a federal refuge where we don't have any jurisdiction, uh, the water areas, which is really the, the centerpiece of the Eisenbeck Refuge and the eelgrass beds there, is managed by um, Fish and Game. And Cape Newenham National Wildlife Refuge, the same thing there, that's in southwest Alaska on the north side of Bristol Bay. Uh, similar situation there, the federal refuge was designated as a, co-designated as a state refuge, but there were uh, waters that were state-owned that were also included in that refuge, so we actually have a management responsibility on those waters. 
And this is just a close-up of some of the Bristol Bay critical habitat areas that I mentioned before that pretty much exist at the mouth of rivers that come into Bristol Bay, very important shorebird, waterfowl habitat, fisheries uh, areas. And many of these, or several of these five areas, either abut or complement national wildlife refuges. So it was important, even though the state selected those lands from the federal government after statehood, uh, we recognize that they're important for fish and wildlife, and they receive this designation by the legislature. So next I want to just take a closer look at some of our specific sites. And I mentioned the McNeil River State Game Sanctuary a few minutes ago. That was created in 1967. And that has a very popular visitor use program. Again, it's the largest congregation of brown bears anywhere in the world. Eighty bears at one time have been spotted in a half-mile section of river. And here is a group of ten people sitting there watching these bears. <laughs> Very popular. People come from all over the world to watch the bears at McNeil. It's so popular we have to have a lottery that people pay to get their name put in every year. And we usually get ten to fifteen times the number of people applying than <laughs> permits that we have and we're restricted by regulation um, to only allow 10 people a day into the sanctuary to go bear viewing. And they go in, they camp in a small campground. Um, they're uh, escorted by fishing game staff that live out there for the summer, and we take them out to the different areas, uh, McNeil River being the focal point of it during July when the chum salmon are running. Uh, but there's a lot of variety of areas that we take the people to to watch bears, and the staff are there to assure uh, the safety of the people with the brown bears, safety of the brown bears from the people, and just to make sure that people, uh, that we're not behaving in a way that's going to either displace the bears from the area, because we want the bears to exist there and catch fish and eat and do what bears need to do. Um, but we also don't want the people to be injured. We don't want them to set up situations where bears are getting food from people or other activities occur that might impact the bear's behavior. So kind of the analogy is we try to be a fly in the wall. Obviously, we can't be that inconspicuous to bears, but as long as the bears don't fear us and they don't look at us as an attraction for food or anything else, um, the situation has worked well for uh, 50 years now uh, that people have been going out to McNeil River to watch bears. And then jumping back to our first protected wildlife area in the state, the Walrus Islands, yeah. uh, Round Island being the center point, uh, focal point of that. Uh, it, uh, Round Island and the Walrus Islands originally was proposed as a federal sanctuary. And so I think at statehood that gave some uh, momentum to those interests to approach the state uh, to have that area selected by the state and then turned into a sanctuary. And we're out there every summer. Uh, we're there to protect the island, make sure um, people don't go out and disturb the walrus inappropriately, either by aircraft or boat. Um, and those visitors that do come to the island, which we do encourage and welcome people to come to the island and watch walrus and other marine wildlife, uh, we just want to make sure that they enjoy their visit out there and do it in such a way that doesn't disturb the walrus. Even though walrus are a huge animal, um, they're easily disturbed by noise and flashes of cameras, um, silhouettes of people watching them from the cliffs above. So really, even for a, a, such a large animal, a pretty sensitive animal as well. We don't want them to get um, disturbed and stampede off the island and injure themselves in the process. Can I ask a question? Sure. About the facilities there on Round Island, I see the buildings. Are, is that for the staff that are, are working out there? Yeah, those buildings. There's a staff cabin. There's tool sheds, um, several outbuildings there. For the public, it's a campground, mm -hmm. and we have some tent platforms people can put their tents on. And then we do provide a cook shelter so people can get in out of the weather, which it's a marine environment, so the weather isn't the best. But... Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, and we provide um, cook stoves for people to um, cook their food on so they don't have to haul food out there. So, and it's a place to get in out of the weather when it gets pretty bad. Sure. And it can get pretty bad, but it can be wonderful. Uh, Round Island on a nice day is paradise. Yeah, and bucket list. It is a wonderful <laughs> place to go. Um, some folks may have heard about uh, Round Island and Walrus Islands because of funding issues. And, of course, the state of Alaska is in a budget crisis. And one of the places that uh, funding was cut was for the program at Round Island. And so we went out to other entities, and fortunately we've been able to find funding elsewhere, either through grants or private donors, 
and we'll talk about that in just a minute, who are um, helping us fund Round Island, keeping our staff out there during the summer months and operating. So we're good for another five years. Wow, great. Um, just to talk about walrus for uh, just a few minutes. So walrus are an international species. They don't know boundaries. They go over to the Russian side. They go on the Alaskan side. Uh, but pretty much they're restricted to the Bering Sea and then up through the Bering Straits in the Southern Arctic uh, Ocean. And in the springtime, as the ice recedes back north, the females, their dependent calves, will move north following the ice edge and they'll give birth on the edge of the ice where they can feed, whereas the males stay behind in Bristol Bay and over on the Russian coast in the Bay of Anadir, and they'll haul out places um, in those areas. And that's what we have at Round Island. It's only males. If we were to get a female there, it would be very unusual. And this shows four uh, sites that walrus uh, generally haul out on the Alaskan side in Bristol Bay, um, Round Island being up here, and Round Island being the most consistently used one and generally the most abundant uh, of the four sites. In past years, we've had as many as 15,000 walrus hauled out on Round Island at one time. We haven't seen those numbers in years. Uh, probably in the past decade or 15 years, uh, probably four to 7,000 would be a high uh, animals. Um, and it does vary. The, the walrus move around, they'll feed in one area and haul out in another, and they go to Russia and come back, and so they do move back and forth, and we know that from radio telemetry work. And just some typical views from uh, Round Island. These were all taken from the top of the bluffs, which is generally where we restrict people um, where they can go is on the bluff tops. We have trails that go along the edge, and people can watch walrus. If we were down on the beach, um, there would be too much disturbance for walrus. Um, this beach photo, it may be one from a camera that is placed on some of the beaches around Round Island, and these cameras were put there by the Annenberg Foundation. They have a program called explore.org, a web-based program, and they've got wildlife cameras, internet cameras scattered all over the world, watching bears and giraffes and zebras and alligators and uh, birds and all sorts of things all over the world, and one of them is walrus. Now, unfortunately, this summer, things got a little expensive for them, so the cameras won't be operating summer of 2019, but they're hopeful they're going to reactivate them in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, the infrastructure is still there. And people can still go to the website, explore.org, and um, see the archive footage and learn about explore.org, learn about uh, walrus and fishing game. Um, it was really a pretty popular um, uh, site when it was operating live, and it would be live images being broadcast out there. In, in last year, we had over four million hits to the site on the wow. internet. That is popular. And then, lastly, briefly, just to talk about our last sanctuary, the Stan Price State Game Sanctuary, or Pat Creek, on Admiralty Island in the southeast. It's another brown bear viewing sanctuary, and it was named after Stan Price, who was a long time. Uh, semi-resident of Pat Creek, and he passed away a number of years ago. He was definitely an Alaskan icon, an Alaskan character, and the sanctuary was named after him. I mentioned Potter Marsh earlier. Um, probably one of our more popular areas. We get about 150,000 people that visit Potter Marsh uh, every year um, for wildlife viewing, photography, walking. Um, just getting outdoors is a very popular place for educational activities, school groups. We do programs down there every year, invite the community out and have all sorts of activities, uh, learning educational activities for them to come down to Potter Marsh and learn about fish and wildlife and um, all sorts of partners that we uh, engage to come down there and join us. Um, in the Matsu Valley, we have several refuges, Palmer Hay Flats, Susitna Flat State Game Refuge, Goose Bay State Game Refuge. Uh, we have campgrounds, we have parking lots, trails, boat launches, viewing decks, all sorts of facilities, facilities there for people to get out and enjoy the area. It's open to almost any kind of outdoor recreational activity. We even allow very limited off-road vehicle use on uh, one of the trails as a way for people to get out there, but we do it and manage it in such a way as to minimize or ideally eliminate any impacts to habitat. Uh, Wolverine <coughs> Creek is a popular site. It's in the Readout Bay critical habitat area on the west side of Cook Inlet, and it's popular for sport fishing and also bear viewing. 
And unfortunately, when you get those two activities centered in the same area, problems can develop. And unfortunately, in the past, we have had problems there where bears were getting fish from the anglers. And then, of course, the bears learn it's easier to get steal a fish from a person than it is to try to catch it on their own. So that's what we call food conditioning of bears, and it's a very dangerous situation. It can result to injury or death to both the bear and potentially the human as well. Uh, so we took some action in there, and uh, we had camps set up during the summer and staff out there that would work with the guides and the clients that were coming in, uh, trying to teach them proper techniques for fishing and handling their food and their fish and we met with them a couple times every year and finally got them to figure it all out so they could still use the site without having the bears obtain fish and food from them and not displace them to allow the bears to still get in and use the site. Uh, Creamers Field is in Fairbanks. It's an old dairy farm and it's a popular area around Fairbanks for watching birds and um, right now the cranes and the geese are coming back into Creamers Field and most of them will move on up into northern or western Alaska to nest um, and then come back in the fall on their southerly migration. Um, Can I ask a question yep. about Kramers? Mm -hmm. um, do I understand correctly that that by having Kramers Field available for the, the geese to land in actually helps keep them away from the airport and yep, causing exactly. problems? Part of our funding for Creamers Field for operating it comes from the FAA and the Department of Transportation. And we do two things there. In the spring, we'll put out grains uh, to attract the birds to the fields at the old farm to pull them away from the airport. And then during summer, crops are planted. And then they're not harvested. They're just plowed under in, in the later summer. So during the fall migration, uh, they'll also be attracted there. And of course, a lot of those um, grains and things are left over and will be there next spring, too, when sure. the fields are opened up. And we'll often have to plow those fields to get rid of some of the snow and increase the melt so it's really open by the time the birds come in. Yeah. So yeah, so, it's, so that's really a win-win for everybody. It helps the birds, it helps the airport, it helps for educational activities at, right. at Creamer's Field. Like the gold that big barns right there. Uh, Minto Flats is a state game refuge just west of Fairbanks and a uh, big wetland complex. Uh, again, important for waterfowl and shorebirds, popular hunting area uh, by the Fairbanks um, area. Um, Chilkat River is in southeast Alaska. It's one of the largest gatherings of bald eagles. Be several thousand bald eagles gathered there late in the fall. Uh, because as most rivers are starting to freeze shut, the Chilkat River will remain open because of warm upwelling and there's salmon spawning in there and the eagles will fly as far away from the mid-lower 48 states all the way up to southeast Alaska to feed on salmon that late in the fall. And that's a joint area. The legislature also um, identified this area as a Chilkat Bald Eagle Preserve, which is managed by Alaska State Park. So it's a joint management between fish and game and Alaska State Parks at this site. And again, just to uh, show you where all of them are around the state. Um, so refuge activities, all sorts of recreational things can be done. Most of them allow hunting, sanctuaries don't. Fishing, trapping, hiking, wildlife viewing, photography, bike riding, boating, retriever training for hunting dogs. Um, dogs that are used for retrieving downed uh, birds for um, bird hunters. Skiing, ice skating. Wind and kite surfing has become popular, parasailing, paragliding, camping, a whole slew of um, activities. We even have a shooting range up uh, just across the street from Creamers Field. And also here in Anchorage, in the Anchorage Coastal Refuge, we have a shooting range. Uh, we allow subsistence activities, uh, some commercial activities, such as guiding, whether it's fishing or other activities. Um, commercial fishing, there's aquaculture, there's livestock, gra livestock grazing in some of our refuge areas. And then we even have industrial activities in some of them, uh, such as oil and gas drilling, uh, communication lines, utilities, material extraction. We even have airports and harbors in some of our areas. But we only allow these other activities, uh, such as the industrial activities, if they're compatible with the primary purpose of the area, which is to protect the habitat. So uh, you might think oil and gas drilling isn't uh, compatible with protecting habitat, but if it's done in such a way that it doesn't significantly impact the habitat, it can be very compatible. Do they have to have a special permit to do some of these activities? Yeah, it's all permitted. And um, you know, an example might be when they want to go explore for oil or gas, 
Uh, we only allow them to do that in the wintertime when the area is frozen and they can go in and do their seismic testing. And if they ever want to develop it, then they would go in and probably have to develop a, a gravel pad and a road to access it. And again, we would only allow them to do that in the winter. And then when the oil or gas well gives out and they abandon it, they have to remove all that gravel and, and return the area to its natural habitat. Uh, as far as numbers of people, I've tried to come up with some kind of a number. It's very difficult because a lot of these areas are remote and we don't have you know, visitor services out there, so no one's monitoring the numbers of people. But I've estimated that anywhere between a million and a half or two million people a year go into our refuge areas. And that's you know, approaching our national park visitation levels. Um, a couple of years ago, national parks in Alaska estimated they had 2.3 million visitors to their national parks. So we're getting up there to a million and a half or two million. Um, so our management goals for these areas is obviously we have to meet our statutory uh, responsibilities. We want to maintain, manage, and enhance compatible public uses. Again, those that don't impact habitat. Uh, we want to allow multiple uses, those commercial industrial activities. And we want to educate um, awareness, appreciation, and support of the refuges and the refuge program. And we primarily do that by encouraging people to get out and use them and explore them. But we still do have a lot of management issues. Just because these areas are by law protected, it doesn't mean in reality that they actually are. And there's a lot of um, challenges that we have um, in these areas. Uh, you know, one challenge we're really faced with now is lack of funding because of state budget crisis. So we're getting imaginative on what we're doing there. And in the interest of time, I'm going to jump ahead here a little bit. But again, one of the things I mentioned, what we're trying to do is really develop stewardship of these areas. Ownership and stewardship. And if we can get people to use these, understand them, appreciate them, particularly kids. Uh, we found working with kids over the past 15, 20 years that if we can educate them to appreciate these areas early on, of course, they're passing that on hopefully to their siblings, their friends, and their parents. But then when they're adults, they're out there doing the same thing and they're helping us protect these areas. Uh, one project that it was really kind of unique was the development of the Kachemak Bay Water Trail. It was a local community-driven interest and a water trail is just that. It's a trail by water for people to go out and boat, kayak, and canoe. And it's a way to promote it and, again, just raise awareness, encourage people to get out there and use it, and teach them about Kachemak Bay, which is one of our critical habitat areas. And we're also working on trying to fix some of our challenges. Uh, after the 1964 earthquake, the municipality and borough of Anchorage, which was separated at the time, they were both looking for a place to get rid of vehicles that no. were damaged during the earthquake. What? We don't know anything about that. We're having a class. I'm sorry, was there a question? No, we just have a visitor. Oh, oh okay, okay. So after the 1964 earthquake, a lot of vehicles were um, disposed at an old bluff site below Kincaid Park in Anchorage. And 50 years later, we're dealing with the legacy of that and cleaning it up. And we did clean it up, uh, mostly through a community and volunteer effort with donated equipment and time. And out of this old landfill, which um, unfortunately gravity pulled a lot of these materials down into the refuge at the base of the bluff, uh, we so far pulled out 81 vehicles, 2,000 tires, and about 100 tons of debris that had been dumped there over the years. Wow. And again, most of that done uh, community effort. Um, these photos are from the Palmer Hay Flats Refuge, and this was um, in the past. This doesn't happen as much anymore. But obviously, you know, garbage dumping, vehicle burning, um, a lot of stolen vehicles abandoned there, and. Um, just a lot of waste, a lot of uh, uh, inappropriate target shooting going on, disposal of, of hazardous waste. These are just some of the challenges that we had to overcome. Um, in some of our other refuges, we have illegal structures being built, whether they're cabins or camps or camps being abandoned. We have refuge neighbors clear-cutting refuge trees to open up the views to their house. Um, we have maintenance issues, bridges falling apart, sidewalks heaving, um, 
encroachment uh, from private property near refuge onto refuge lands. Um, just recently we had some vandalism down at Potter Marsh where a gang graffiti showed up one morning. And a lot of these um, inappropriate activities, we were kind of overwhelmed. We didn't know what to do. There were very few staff. We couldn't really patrol. We couldn't clean up uh, as well. And so we did what I call the extreme makeover in our refuges. And we went in and we cleaned them up. We got the um, Army National Guard to help us out with 100 of their recruits. We got uh, users to come out and help us build trails. We got the Matsu Borough to help donate a, a bathroom, Boy Scouts to build kiosks, community volunteers to build trails and boardwalks, uh, put in signage and new interpretive panels. Uh, our refuge friends group in the Palmer Hay Flats got funding to build a new viewing tower. Um, we just recently found out we got new funding to enhance the um, pullouts at Potter Marsh on the south end of the marsh. Um, and these activities are working. Again, it's getting people out into the refuges, it's cleaning them up, it's displacing those inappropriate activities, uh, making people want to visit these areas, and it's working. Um, people really have taken notice over the past 10 years or so of our state refuge areas and are really helping us to manage these um, areas. Uh, just one last project that we're working on up at Creamers Field in Fairbanks is working with one of our community partners, the Conservation Fund, in purchasing 480 acres of wetlands adjacent to the refuge from the University of Alaska and protecting that in perpetuity. Um, and how are we doing all this? Well, we don't have a lot of money just sitting around, but we're doing it with grants, with community partners. Um, uh, Conical Phillips, as an example, stepped forward and gave us a lot of money for several projects in our refuges. And um, we do it with funding from the permits that are required out at McNeil River and, and Round Island and Stan Price. And we're doing it by um, convincing the kids in the community that the, the refuges are places to protect and to cherish. Um, and we're also getting the attention of our political leaders who are looking at uh, helping us out in any ways they can, whether it's um, lending support to federal grants or giving us exposure. And um, so it's, it's working. People are really taking note of the refuge areas and uh, realizing what's out there. And, um, you know, again, it all gets tied back into protecting the habitats for the wildlife. And if we can do that and we can get the community and the local neighbors to adopt these areas as theirs and develop that stewardship, it makes our job easier. But I don't want an easy job. I want a, I want a challenging job, but it makes it attainable. And we can't do it without that community stewardship and engagement. Mm -hmm. Great. And if there are any questions, we can go from there. I guess I'm just really uh, amazed at how things can get off the dime once people who care about it come together. And that's one of the things that I was really impressed me when I first came to work at a fishing game. That's when that cleanup was happening. And um, it, it just, even working with the other agencies, when, you know, it makes a huge difference when we collaborate and it grows community too. So these service learning projects that students might be doing at the refuge or even in their, you know, on their schoolyards, I think continues to build and feed back into our community. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a great example if you're teaching about civics or about um, current events or something like that to really point that out to students that that collaboration makes things happen. Yep, you can make a difference. If you see something that needs done, you know, you can step forward, help us out, get partners engaged. We've had so many Boy Scouts and community councils and friends groups and just neighbors coming out and helping out and, and making a difference. And yeah, it's that collaboration. You know, individually we can't do much, but together we can do a lot. And, People start to take notice when you get a neighborhood or community going and um, it gets the attention of donors and, and others that have an influence. And well, when we have these public places that are well developed and accessible and uh, people have that sense of ownership, it actually um, really benefits like property values and quality of life in a community. People want to come here and stay here, raise their kids generationally. Um, and that's good for our state, 
as well. So yeah, certainly. So it's a re- great investment. Yeah, the Palmer Hay Flat's a good example. The neighbors, um, it was driving them crazy having all that illegal target shooting and garbage dumping and vehicle burning and drug mm-hmm. activity, and we got rid of all that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, yeah, it increases their property value, their neighborhood quality, and they really appreciate it. Sure. That, that's that's public service, yep. you know? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty impressive all that you're doing there. Quite impressive. That's a lot of... Yep, and, lot of and, and, and I certainly don't take really very much credit for this at all. It's really the partners that step up, the community, the, the kids, the, the scout troops. Um, you know, it's everybody that steps forward. As a team, we're doing it. Mm-hmm. I'm just one guy, and I only have a few staff, so we're not able to do a whole lot. Here's a perfect example. One of our early refuge managers was trying to put some informational kiosks up in the Palmer Hay Flats, and she installed one at one site, went to another site to install, but then had to go back to that first site to change something, and it had already been shot full of bullet holes in the three or four hours that she was gone. And she kind of gave up. But then a few years later, the community came forward and said, we're tired of this. We want to start a friends group. And they started working with the local schools and the friends group, and it just took off from there. And these areas now are pretty much kept clean. Uh, The community appreciates them. We don't see much of that illegal dumping and target shooting anymore. They're family-friendly areas now. And places where classes can go. I mean, Reflections Lake is a great tour around the lake. There's many activities that you can do with students and real learning opportunities in situ yep. as opposed to just, you know, seeing it one dimensionally. So, um, yeah, I can see there's a lot of pride and yep. uh, community pride in that as well. What, when, I, when I drive back past Reflections Lake on the Glen Highway and see four or five school buses sitting there, that I appreciate that. Yeah, that's it's great that they engage it. Um, I had a question, too, uh, about, uh, like, a host. Mm-hmm. Do, all of, do, do all of the major, um, like, easy public access points have them, or do you, are they volunteers? Or? They are volunteers, all of our hosts. Um, we try to match their expenses. So mm-hmm. we'll pay for their, you know, gas they need to um, produce electricity for their camper or heat it. Um, and get water and wastewater, and then we try to give them a little stipend to pay for their food. But obviously they're going to great expense just coming up to Alaska, because most of them are from out of Alaska. Um, But they want to do it for the experience and the joy of doing it. So we try to make it as least burden or small burden financially as we can. And they are volunteers donating their time. Uh, We only have hosts in four of our sites. We have one at Potter Marsh in the Anchorage Coastal, two in the Palmer Hay Flats at Reflections and Cottonwood Creek, although we don't always get hosts that want to go to those areas, and then at Creamers Field in Fairbanks. Mm -hmm. So those are the only four sites. I take that back. There was a fifth site, the Little Sioux Public Use Facility in the Susitna Flats, and that's kind of a unique site because we contract that site with Alaska State Parks. And so they actually manage that site for us with the campground, the boat launch, and fee collection. They're set up much better to do all that. Um, as, you know, as far as visitor services, law enforcement, patrolling, fee collecting. Um, so it works out well for both of us, both agencies to do uh, that. It's like a subcontractor yeah, or something exactly. like that. Yeah, huh. exactly. That's great. I think you've had um, some of those volunteers return, and that's yep. really great as an educator that, you know, you know these folks are out there and they're passionate, and, and sometimes they want to do education programs or, you know, answer questions by the general public. They're not just security guards. Exactly, no. And actually, in the job description for those hosts, I say that the primary duty is to enhance um, the visitor experience in these areas. Obviously, they're doing that by providing security and replenishing the toilet paper in the bathrooms. But really, it's that interaction they're having with the visitors. Um, And at Potter Marsh, they do um, bird walks down there. And they'll also just go out on the boardwalk and set up spotting scopes so people can watch um, the eagle nest that's nearby or a unique bird. Um, So it really is about education and enhancing the experience of the visitor. And they have a skookum opportunity to be there when no one else is there. Yeah, exactly. And that's, you know, the the in-between times when the lynx might pop out by the beaver lodge or something like that. Or the brown bears underneath the boardwalk at Potter Marsh early (laughs) in the morning. (laughs) That's pretty cool. 
feeding on salmon, doing what bears are supposed to be doing on That's a salmon right. stream. Yeah. Maybe I'll after I retire. Yeah. <laughs> Did either of you have any questions or anything you'd like to add? No. no. Uh, all this information is on the website for people to access, yes? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, website www.refuges.adfg.alaska.gov. Or you can just do a Google search for Alaska State Refuges. And we've got a lot of information out there on, on all 32 refuges, um, what uh, type of fish and wildlife are there, and some information on how to visit uh, trails and, and other facilities. I think um, there's some really great resources on there. And if you go to our Facebook page when things happen, that's a great you know, um, reminder of the activities that will be happening. And these teachers will either be going to the Palmer Hay Flats, Fun on the Flats Day, or to Potter Marsh okay. Discovery Days to do their interactive portion of this course. So that will be fun to close the loop, so yeah. to speak. And I'm hoping that falcated duck is still around mm. for Potter Marsh oh. Day and it decides to move to the north side of the marsh yeah. where it's visible from the boardwalk. That would be pretty pretty amazing. I, uh, if they release another eagle, that eagle will be jealous oh, for yeah. not getting the all of the attention. Yeah, well, we definitely don't want to see that eagle grab our duck either. <laughs> no. I know, that's no. what I thought. <laughs> yeah. Has that happened before? Like, uh, well, we've never had <laughs> such a rare duck like that there. But the eagles do feed on the ducks and the geese uh, at Potter Marsh. Sure. Um, the, uh, the goslings, um, you know, they're running around with the adults, uh, you know, another month or so when they start hatching out. We just call it eagle bait um, <laughs> because the number of goslings will decline through the summer, and it's the eagles and other predators get them. But, I mean, that's the evolutionarily how they, you know, evolved is – uh, basically by mass numbers, you know, different species will either reproduce with lots of young because a lot of them are going to get eaten um, or otherwise not survive. Others will just have few uh, offspring and it's a lot more investment into that one or two or three offspring rather than eight or ten or a dozen. Right, right. I, I had one more question about how uh, Potter Marsh was developed and um, it, it wasn't always the size that it is right now. That's correct. Um, just over 100 years ago, the Alaska Railroad uh, took a shortcut mm -hmm. when they were building the railroad. Um, they started it in 1916, and they wanted to obviously take the shortest way between, well, ultimately what was Fairbanks or, or Delta Junction to Seward and, and uh, Tidewater. And when they went past the area that's now Potter Marsh, it was a shallow bay, and they just built an embankment across the mouth of that bay and basically impounded fresh water behind it and over the decades created a marsh, which is now Potter Marsh. And it's the largest freshwater marsh, coastal freshwater marsh in Cook Inlet. Uh, so it's kind of unique in that regard. Um, and it's all due to the railroad embankment. But it doesn't mean it was nothing there before. It really just altered the habitat that was there before. It was probably more of a brackish, saltwater, sedge marsh, similar to what we see on the rest of the coast of Anchorage. Hmm. It's interesting how sometimes development, you know, we can take advantage of how development has altered the landscape. There are other uh, lakes like that in Anchorage that were sand or gravel pits and filled in and people, you know, the people decided to save that and use that. Yeah. Reflections Lake is a good example. Yeah. It was a gravel pit built in 1963 um, when the original two-lane Glen Highway was built across the flats. Prior to that, the only way between Anchorage and the valley was the old Glen Highway. Mm -hmm. And they built a two-lane highway across where the highway is now. And, of course, then years later in the 80s, expanded it out to four lanes. Um, but this was a gravel source for the original two-lane um, highway across the flats, and they had to pump it when they were using it to keep the water from filling up the pit. And, of course, when they were done extracting gravel, they took the pumps out and it filled up with water and it turned into a lake. Wow. And then a dumping site and a target yeah. shooting site and a party <laughs> site. And it used to be called Rambo Rest Stop, and then that's when the community stepped in with us and said, no more, we cleaned it up and fixed it up, and now we have a great recreational facility. 
I think that really gives a person hope that whatever the situation is, if you know, you can get together in one mind and make stuff happen. Yep. So, like, many well, hands make light work. Light, that's right, and good coordination. I yep. must say. Yes. And a little bit of money thrown in. Oh, okay, a little bit of money to sprinkle in on yeah. the top. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Joe. I really appreciate you coming in and uh, giving us your valuable time to uh, talk to us about the refuge system and kind of try to unravel it for us because people do ask, you know, what's the difference? Because if, if they're traveling here, it's different in another state or managed differently and they don't understand why we're not DNR or whatever the case might be. So. Yeah. Um, it's good to create some clarity. And I think if you're teaching about civics and how regulations, how um, statutes are developed, um, and what a constitution actually holds for direction for the state, this is a great example and something that they can go out and look at and see that, oh, this, is, this was intentional. Um, you know, they put it to side intentionally instead of just haphazardly. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's maybe a little more interesting than some of the other ways that statutes are created. So uh, it's just another little piece of the pie, kind of like the Board of Game is unique in Alaska among other states in the U.S. in how we direct fish and game regulations and the public process. And in every step of the way, the, the message has been through all of this series is that Alaskans have a voice. Alaskans have ownership. Alaskans can be motivated to direct what happens in their state. And um, I would really love to see more students understand that and grab hold of it, too. So like I said, this is our last uh, webinar in the series. I'll be connecting with both of you uh, regarding the materials and other projects, and we'll have a discussion about which one of the um, uh, public days that you'll be attending. I've got some ideas about that. So uh, with that, if there's no other further questions, I think we'll wrap it up for tonight. Okay. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. Very nice. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. You Thank too. you. You too. Bye. Bye. Thanks.